This is a 3D printed shape that I did not design. In fact, no human designed it. This is the result of a simulation that I wrote, where 16,000 some odd particles were thrown into a box and allowed to basically stick together and congeal into whatever shape they wanted. And they decided to make this, which is pretty fascinating. At first glance, this just looks sort of like rough and lumpy, but if you look closely, there's actually a whole bunch of faces that have flattened off, all at very distinct angles to one another. There's a lot of symmetry in this shape, and none of that symmetry was actually programmed into the simulation at the start. The idea that systems following very simple rules can evolve and exhibit very complicated patterns and behavior is a theme found throughout math and physics, and this particular example is known as crystallization, and that's what I'm going to be showing you today. I wanted to open this video with an example of a naturally occurring crystal like quartz because I think that that's what most people probably think of when they hear the word crystal. And for that reason, I'm here in the Earth Sciences Department today where they have lots of beautiful samples of various minerals. And I found out that if you ask a geologist for a photogenic piece of quartz to hold up in a YouTube video and say, hey, check this out, this is a cool crystal, you are liable to get more than you bargained for. These are three samples of quartz that are absolutely gorgeous and sort of comedically massive. I've just been staring at them since I got here today. So yeah, this is a piece of quartz. It is a naturally occurring mineral made of silicon and oxygen, and this is a pretty large piece of it. We'll get into why these facets form in a minute, but for now I think you'll agree with me that this is a pretty classic crystal shape. There's a distinct pattern here. As these crystals formed, they naturally grew to have flat sides at perfect 120 degree angles to each other. Although a big transparent object with, you know, nice flat reflective facets is probably what most people think of as a crystal, we're not going to limit ourselves. This wafer of silicon, the same material that is used to make processors in phones and computers, is also a crystal. Every flake of graphite in this pencil is a crystal. And even this random part that I found made of aluminum is crystalline. So what does crystalline really even mean? First, let's take the opposite of a crystal, an amorphous material like a glass. Common glass like this is made of silicon and oxygen just like the quartz that I showed you a second ago, except the atoms are arranged differently in glass versus quartz. If you took this glass paperweight and you zoomed in on it to the point where you could see individual silicon and oxygen atoms, bond lengths would all be about the same, but the angles would all be messed up. There'd be no repeating pattern of, of atomic placements in this material. Crystals, on the other hand, have all of their constituent atoms arranged in a very precise repeating pattern. If you zoomed in on this piece of aluminum to the point where you could see individual atoms, you'd find that they were all arranged in tiny little cubes. If you zoomed in on this piece of quartz far enough, you'd be able to see that all of the atoms are actually forming tiny little triangles. For this piece of semiconductor here, I can just tell you that the atoms are arranged in a cubic lattice. You don't have to take my word for it because a short walk across campus, there is one of these that I can actually use to show you those atoms. This is a transmission electron microscope, not to be confused with a scanning electron microscope, a scanning transmission electron microscope, or a scanning tunneling microscope. Acronyms are hard. If we load in a tiny speck of material and zoom in about a million times magnification, we can see that the atoms are forming this perfect tiny grid structure. So those are actual atoms that we can see coming together and forming this pattern to make a crystal lattice. So how does this happen? I, if you were an atom, how would you possibly know where to go or where you needed to move to in order to become part of a larger crystal lattice and join up with this pattern in exactly the right place? That's the really beautiful part in my mind, and surprisingly, the answer is that the atoms themselves have absolutely no idea. Crystals are an emergent phenomenon, meaning that despite how complicated and fancy they look when you've got the whole crystal lattice pattern assembled, it's simply what you get when you let a system evolve obeying a simple set of rules and eventually form some more complicated pattern. In this case, those simple rules are the forces that 
adjacent atoms exert on each other. And the pattern that you get as the result is a crystal lattice. That isn't to say that atoms are the only things that can do this. This thing that's taking up basically the entire living room right now is a physical system that obeys very simple rules that we can use to produce very complicated behavior. This is a demo that I've been thinking about for a long time and I kind of just wanted to see it work, but hopefully it makes a cool segment in a video too. All of these red and blue circles are magnets that are embedded in pieces of wood so that they float in this pool of water. And I can agitate this pool of water to make all of the magnet disks sort of shake around whenever I want by turning on either this motor or that motor or by sort of shaking the entire bath by hand. Let's take the simplest rules for our system that we can imagine. The red disks repel each other, the blue disks repel each other, but the red disks and the blue disks want to stick together, kind of like magnets. <laughs> All right, so I have loaded the pool with a whole bunch of red disks and blue disks, and we can actually see some patterns starting to form already, but I'm going to mess the whole thing up, turn on the agitation, and we will see what happens. If you've ever played with a whole bunch of magnets before, the, uh, the first example here, you probably can predict what's about to happen. So this happened like really fast. The time lapse may be way too fast. There's been like less than 10 minutes of this thing running and every single disc in the, the simulation here has joined the crystal and they have formed themselves into this fantastic checkerboard pattern of red and blue discs. Why? Why would they choose to organize themselves in this particular way? There was nothing about the setup that said red and blue discs must stick together at 90 degree angles. All the discs were round, but for some reason, they all worked together to make this pattern. So let's do an experiment, change our simple rules of the system, and find out what difference that makes to the resulting crystal structure. Uh, specifically, what if we made the blue discs twice as large and twice as magnetic? So I'm going to be replacing every two blue discs with one of these big blue discs, and we're going to see what effect that has on the system. And if you think about it, it's really not a dramatic change. I mean, the discs are still round. It's not like we're biasing the angles that these things are going to stick together and, you know, force a different structure to happen. But throwing these in here, there's not a really obvious structure forming already, so I need to turn on the motors, let this shake around a bit, and we'll see what happens. So what's happening here is that these discs are wandering around randomly, sticking together into whatever random patterns and then breaking apart again. If they form an unstable pattern, they're more likely to subsequently break apart. But if they happen by random chance to form a really stable pattern that requires a lot of energy to break up, they're more likely to stay in that arrangement. Formation of crystal structures is basically trial and error until all of the particles get stuck in their most stable arrangement, and then they don't really move anymore. 
So that doesn't exactly look like a checkerboard pattern anymore, does it? By making one tiny change to the initial rules of the system, we've completely upheaved the crystal structure formed by that system. Instead of the checkerboard square pattern of red and blue disks, we get hexagons and triangles made of red and blue disks. A completely new pattern that repeats through the entire structure, except for these guys over here that sort of got stuck against this wall and have been doing their own thing. I think this is just awesome, and deceptively complex behavior like this is really what makes physics so interesting. In this case, the pattern formed by these disks floating in water is governed by the relative sizes of the red and blue disks. Red and blue disks. The relative sizes of the disks control how many disks can fit around each other. Then that local arrangement is repeated to form the whole crystal structure. If the disks are the same size, it's easy to fit four blues around a red. And a square checkerboard pattern means that the structure has an equal number of reds and blues in it, so it works. However, if we make the blues larger and larger, they repel each other and eventually only three blues can fit around a single red meaning that the smallest repeated unit turns into a triangle, and we get this new pattern made of triangles and hexagons. So what happens when you try this in three dimensions? When I started the video, I showed you this 3D printed shape that I said was the result of this process occurring in 3D. Now, in 3D, we wouldn't want disks that were free to move around on a plane. We would want spheres that were free to, you know, fly around in three space and attract and repel each other in the same way that the magnet disks did. You can't do this with magnets without getting a Nobel Prize along the way because you'd need monopoles. So instead, I just wrote a simulation and did it in a computer. Just like in the magnet model, we have red particles and blue particles, and the opposite particles attract and like particles repel. Now the simulation just throws particles in towards the center and allows them to assemble. But before we get started, let's make a prediction. If the size ratio of two spheres is above 0.22, you can fit four blues around a red, forming tetrahedra. If the size ratio is above 0.41, you can fit six blues around a red, forming octahedra. And if the size ratio is above 0.73, you can fit eight blues around a red, forming a cube. For simplicity, I went with equal sized ions, so there's a one-to-one -one radius ratio. The red spheres are just as big as the blue spheres. And that means that we could predict that we would have a cubic structure where every unit cube is a red atom surrounded by eight blue atoms that make up the corners of that cube. So if we let this simulation go for a minute and more and more particles are thrown in towards the center where they're accumulating and this crystal is growing in three dimensions, if you look very closely, you can see that around every red ion, there are eight blue ions and they are in fact forming the cesium chloride crystal structure. It's really wonderful when math works sometimes. If we fast forward a bit, we can see that after a while, all the particles in the crystal start vibrating. This is an intentional part of the simulation intended to serve the same purpose as the motor shaking the pool of water in the magnet demo earlier. By giving the particles the energy to move around, they have an easier time of finding their ideal position in the crystal. The coolest thing about this simulation is that if you let it run for long enough, the entire mass of particles begins to take on a specific shape. In this case, that shape is a rhombic dodecahedron. I actually had to go look that up when I noticed it being formed in this simulation. I, I did not originally realize that that was going to be the crystal habit, the you know arrangement of planes on the outside of the crystal. If the relative size of the particles controls the local structure, like how many atoms can fit around each other, which then guides the crystal structure, the repeating arrangement of atoms, then how could the entire structure ever possibly take on you know, an ordered shape. It's a whole nother level of self-assembly and just like the arrangement of the crystal lattice itself, it relies heavily on trial and error. If we trace a single particle in this simulation, like this red particle here that's flying around, we can see that eventually it actually lands on the surface of the growing crystal. But once it's on the crystal, it doesn't actually stop moving. It keeps wandering around until it gets really solidly stuck. You could imagine in two dimensions that a particle on a neutral surface is at most bonded to one other particle. But 
if it were to find a ledge, or better yet, actually a hole, it could get two or three bonds holding it in place, making it less likely to keep moving. If we watch what this red atom does after it gets stuck to the surface, it sort of meanders through this trench and it moves along a little bit and eventually gets stuck, effectively extending these nearby flat surfaces. Now it's not like this atom came down and said, oh man, there's a huge, big, nice flat surface. I'm going to try to extend that surface and make it longer so I should bond to the edge. The atom has no idea that there's a big flat surface there. The atom's just bouncing around and eventually it gets stuck but it's more likely to get stuck at the edge of a surface than it is to just stick to the surface flat. These particles are assembling what is a very complicated shape in three-dimensional space, and the only tool that they have at their disposal is to throw themselves at the crystal and see whether or not they stick. If we let this simulation run for another 20 minutes and anneal itself into a really nice, smooth, beautiful shape, and then shrink wrap that shape in MATLAB, convert it to an STL, slice it, and print it out, we can get this. A complicated three-dimensional structure with cubic crystal symmetry and a rhombic dodecahedral crystal habit, all because red spheres were attracted to blue spheres. And I think that's just beautiful physics.